The Time Bubble by Jason Ayres Narrated by Nigel Carrington Prologue Nobody knew how long the time bubble had been there, nor did they know how it had come to be there in the first place. Had it not been for the construction of the HS2 high-speed rail link, it may well have lain undiscovered for centuries, buried beneath several feet of grass and mud. The residents fought tooth and nail to prevent the monstrosity of HS2 being built across the outskirts of their sleepy market town. But it was all to no avail. Successive governments were determined to push the project through, and in the autumn of 2018 the contractors moved in. They ripped up the leafy landscape and began to lay down the new railway line. No expense was spared to ease the pain of the local residents. A multi-million pound new road system, an out-of-town retail park, and a new estate of 5,000 eco-homes were all created to help put the town on the map, as the planners described it. Those on the bright and shiny new housing estate had easy access to the town beneath the new railway line via a new pedestrian tunnel, brightly lit by fluorescent yellow tubes. A road tunnel to accompany it would soon be completed. It was all very safe, clean and modern. The residents had little fear of being mugged in the tunnel. There was little crime in the affluent town and for added peace of mind there was CCTV at either end. But then they had no inkling whatsoever of the ancient secret that the newly constructed tunnel had uncovered. End of Prologue Chapter 1 22nd October 2018, 9.30am When 17-year-old Charlie Adams set out for school on Monday morning, it was just another day as far as he was concerned. It was almost halfway through the autumn term, and he was less than two months into his A-levels. After the stress of GCSEs the previous summer, things now seemed remarkably relaxed. This particular morning he was struggling to motivate himself to get off to school. It had been a rather heavy weekend. On Saturday night his best friend Joshua had held a house party whilst his parents were away. Joshua's father owned a successful local building business and had done well enough to enable the family to buy a four-bedroom townhouse on the new estate. It was tailor-made for a teenage party. There had been a lot of music, a lot of smoking, and a huge amount of drink, secured from the local supermarket, courtesy of Josh's older brother. Charlie had spent the whole night talking to his childhood sweetheart, Kaylee, trying to pluck up the courage to kiss her, and failing miserably. It didn't help matters that Josh had disappeared into his bedroom sometime in the small hours with Kaylee's best friend, Lauren, not emerging until well after breakfast time with a smug look on his face. Charlie couldn't remember all the details, thanks to a large influx of strong cider, but he had the vaguely uneasy feeling he had done something embarrassing. He decided to lay low on Sunday and keep off the social media sites just in case. The party had still been going on well after daybreak on Sunday morning, and it was nearly lunchtime by the time Charlie made it back home. So, unsurprisingly, he wasn't quite at his best now, at 9.30am on Monday morning. He headed into the bathroom, brushed his floppy black hair back away from his face and washed. He looked into the mirror and his green eyes stared back at him. He was relieved to see that they were not looking too bloodshot. He really had caned that cider and had vague memories of some sort of drinking game involving shots, but it was all rather hazy. He thought about having a shave, but the awkward truth was that he still didn't need to more than about once a week. He was a bit of a late developer on that front. Josh, on the other hand, was always boasting to him about how he'd been shaving every day since he was 14. Whether that was true or not was difficult to say. Josh did have a tendency to boast about things. He was shaken out of his half-awake state by his mother's voice shouting from the foot of the stairs. "'Shouldn't you be at school by now?' came the time-honoured question. "'No, let me guess, it's a free period!' 
he wandered out to the top of the stairs to reply we don't call them that any more mum it's a study period he replied rather lamely he didn't have the stomach for an argument in fact all he could think about at that precise moment was marmite on toast not much studying going on by the looks of it i guess you'll be wanting this his mother held up the marmite jar thanks mum any chance of a cup of tea i'll be down in a minute you'll have to make it yourself i've got to get going i'm due in at ten i won't be home until late tonight we've got a stock take at the shop i've made you some sandwiches for school but can you sort yourself out for some tea i think i can manage he replied as long as there was a pizza in the freezer he'd manage with his mother gone charlie switched on the kettle put two slices of bread into the toaster and opened up the marmite pot a glance at the kitchen window confirmed that it was looking pretty gloomy outside but he didn't mind that after saturday night's party the cloud and drizzle were a lot easier on the eyes than bright sunshine the toast popped up and he sat down at the circular pine table in the centre of the kitchen he hadn't realized how hungry he was until he started on the two slices of toast it clearly wasn't going to be enough so another two slices went in that along with the tea did the trick he was beginning to feel vaguely human again and started to think he might even make it into school before midday to all intents and purposes it was just another normal monday morning he could not have begun to imagine the strange events that would begin to unfold later in the day by the time charlie eventually made it into school he'd missed not only his study period but also his first class it was almost lunch time so he headed straight for the canteen by the time he got there and opened the large double swing doors josh and his other mates were already there as soon as they saw him the ribbing started here he is look casanova came josh's opening line triggering much sniggering from the others mate did you make a fool of yourself on saturday or what um i can't remember exactly perhaps you'd better fill me in replied charlie an unpleasant feeling of dread beginning to spread over him can't remember <laughs> that's convenient if i were you i wouldn't want to remember either i'm talking about you and kaylee don't you remember what you said i'm not sure i want to but i'm sure you're going to tell me charlie sat down opened his bag and then his lunchbox which contained a sandwich and a bag of crisps josh could scarcely conceal the glee in his voice as he related the story you got really drunk and ended up sitting on the stairs pouring your heart out to kaylee you said you loved her and wanted to marry her it's true chipped in daniel a rather obese looking lad from the other side of the table we all heard you shut up dan and concentrate on eating your chips retorted a seriously riled charlie was it really that bad i'm afraid it was mate continued josh he could see charlie was looking a bit upset and decided to soften his approach a little they were best mates after all the thing is i do think she likes you but you're putting her off by being way too keen almost stalkerish in fact how do you mean i mean things like commenting and liking her every facebook status following her around the school like a lovesick puppy and the fact that you've got a heart drawn on the back of your english folder with a c and k engraved into it just little things like that you're trying too hard mate well what do you suggest then what would you try i don't have to try mate they always come to me replied josh his bravado returning didn't you notice me and lauren disappear for an hour during the party she was an absolute animal i can tell you it was true and charlie knew it josh was the archetypal blonde and blue-eyed boy and he had the girls falling at his feet whilst charlie was painfully aware of his own lack of experience it seemed so unjust to him josh was so casual about it all and didn't seem to express any feelings for the various girlfriends he'd had charlie on the other hand felt he had so much to offer love romance and loyalty but he seemed to be getting nowhere fast well i think i'd better keep a low profile for a few days charlie responded i'll hide out in the library a bit none of the lads ever go in there yes but kaylee does that's why you're going there interjected daniel in between a couple of mouthfuls of sausage dan haven't you got any vending machines to be raiding or something you've not exactly got women falling at your feet have you 
He's not bothered about any of that, are you, Dan? said Josh. He loves his food too much. Speaking of which, did you want that bag of crisps, Charlie? asked Dan, noticing from the untouched bag that Charlie had eaten his sandwich and left the crisps. Here, have it. I've lost my appetite. I'll see you in English. Charlie got up and headed for the door. He heard some laughter behind him and was sure he heard the word loser, almost certainly from Daniel, but he ignored it. Soon he was outside in the fresh autumn breeze, away from the stifling atmosphere of the canteen. End of chapter one. Chapter two. 22nd October 2018, 2 p.m. Charlie was not the only one having a bad day. 48-year-old English teacher Peter Grant was preparing for his 2 p.m. class of Year 12 students. He was already exhausted and fed up with the day. His Year 10 students had run him ragged that morning, and a ridiculous lunchtime argument in the staff room over who was responsible for the washing up of the coffee cups hadn't helped. All of this he would have dealt with in his stride a few years ago, but he'd had more than his fair share of bad days since then. Ruefully, he reflected on the fact that he wasn't so much having a bad day as a bad year. In fact, if he was brutally honest, it was turning out to be a bad decade, and there didn't seem to be much prospect of things improving with only a year or so of it still to go. Discovering he had leukaemia three years ago had come as a bolt out of the blue, he had always taken care of himself, exercised, eaten healthily and never smoked. Like most people, he had just assumed that this was the sort of thing that happened to other people. Thankfully, it had been caught early enough for it to be treated, and he'd been in remission for a couple of years now. But there was no guarantee that it might not reoccur at some point in the future. It was preying on his mind more than usual today as he'd had a call from the surgery asking him to come in for an appointment as soon as possible, bearing in mind how difficult it was usually to get any sort of appointment at the surgery, this was more than a little worrying. He'd just gotten over the illness when he had to deal with the shocking revelation that his wife had been having an affair with his best friend for the past five years. He didn't even have the chance to forgive her. Once the truth was out, she announced she was leaving and packed her suitcase the next day. There were no children to keep them together. For one reason or another, they had never got round to it. Now, at 48, single, he had resigned himself to the fact that he would probably never become a dad. He tried not to think about it too much, because if he did, it began to eat away at his soul in the same way that the cancer had eaten away at his body. Peter was not an unattractive man, he no longer had the thick mane of hair of his younger years and was beginning to pad out a little around the middle, but he felt he had a few good years in him yet. If he ever did get a date with anyone, he knew he would have to play down some of his less attractive hobbies. He was a huge sci-fi fan, and during his divorce proceedings it came to light that his wife's affair had begun whilst he was away at one of his conventions. His dream scenario would be to meet a woman who shared such interests, but he knew it was unlikely. He didn't know what the ratio was, but he guessed that for every female sci-fi geek, there must be at least ten men. It was very gloomy outside and had now started to rain. His attention was drawn to it as it began to batter on the window. It did little to help his mood. Students began filing into the room in dribs and drabs. It was already three minutes past two, most of them late as usual. Hey, sir, what did you think of the new doctor? piped up Daniel as he waddled in, half-eaten chocolate bar in hand. The kids were well aware of Peter's sci-fi obsession, and on Saturday night it had been the first episode of the show he'd watched religiously since he was a small boy. He'd never hidden behind the sofa, to use an oft-quoted cliché, but then that would have been quite tricky as the sofa in his childhood home had its back to the wall. He did remember being scared, though. His first memory was of giant lizard-like monsters baring their teeth at him from his television set when he was three years old. I think I preferred the last one. It's difficult to see how they're going to follow him, was his response. I watched it on the internet last night. I couldn't see it on Saturday night as I was at a party, said Daniel. Peter wasn't particularly interested in hearing about Daniel's weekend. The boy was a pain in the neck at the best of times, 
so he decided to change the subject and inquired do you know where the others are it's almost five past now don't you kids have any concept of time not knowing what was going to transpire over the next few days the irony of how prophetic that comment would turn out to be was lost on him the class should have had sixteen students in it but there were less than half of them present i'm not sure if charlie's coming he's sulking because cayley won't go out with him said daniel reverting to type he loved nothing better than grassing on people and stirring things up in general give it a rest dan you don't know anything about it the response came from the shorter of the two girls sitting at the front of the class at a desk next to the rain-lashed window lauren watson and cayley thomas had been best friends since reception class as was usually the case it had been lauren who had spoken she was a pretty feisty creature who didn't suffer fools gladly and would always leap to her best friend's defence the two girls couldn't have looked more different lauren was the shorter of the two no more than five feet with short black hair cut into a bob a button nose and a face and mouth that curved into a very cheeky grin although diminutive in stature she more than made up for it in spirit and few people wanted to get on the wrong side of her cayley on the other hand was taller but much quieter her long blonde hair cascaded down in gorgeous wavy spirals to her shoulders complementing a slim but strong frame piercingly clear blue eyes gazed out from her soft and perfect complexion she truly was a beautiful young woman and although she knew it she didn't play upon it as some do it wasn't hard to see why charlie was so smitten by her speak of the devil said daniel as charlie wandered unenthusiastically into the room cayley kept her head down but lauren made sure she gave charlie a dirty look as he invariably glanced across to the window where he knew cayley would be sitting good of you to join us said peter and winced almost as soon as he had said it he knew he made the same lame comment every time a student was late for class but it had become such a force of habit that he said it without thinking he really ought to think of something more original charlie offered little more than a grunt in return as he took his seat next to josh right i guess we should make a start where did we get to said peter taking out his copy of aldous huxley's brave new world peter bemoaned the lack of sci-fi on the a-level syllabus brave new world was about as close as it got so he always made sure it was the first book he did with his students each year after that the rest of the year tended to go downhill a bit even now over a quarter of a century after he graduated he wondered if perhaps he should have become a science teacher rather than an english teacher where did we get to right then page one hundred and thirty two he felt like it was going to be a long afternoon thankfully the rain had relented by the end of the day charlie tried to slip away quietly but josh caught up with him by the school gates what's up mate he inquired you know what's up replied charlie is it because cayley won't go out with you you know damn well that's not what it is it's you lot taking the piss out of me all the time i'm sorry mate i was only joshing with you this was one of josh's favorite phrases and he used it whenever he could not so much you it's dan and lauren's been dead off with me as well you don't want to worry about dan he's a loser you've got a lot more going for him than he has a six inch smaller waist size for a start there's more chance of oxford united winning the fa cup than there is of him getting a shag josh was doing his utmost to make light of the situation to cheer charlie up and it seemed to be working yes you're right said charlie his mood lightening shall we go down jay's for a bite to eat mum's not going to be at home tonight so she won't be expecting me for tea you twisted my arm you buying then i spent all my dosh on the booze for the party come on then with charlie smiling for the first time that day they headed off towards town jay's diner was the latest addition to the town centre in the last couple of years there had been a resurgence of interest in 1950s culture and jay's reflected this it was brightly lit with strip neon lighting seats and tables shaped into the style of classic 1950s muscle cars and a wurlitzer jukebox playing the likes of elvis little richard and chuck berry it captured the mood of the era perfectly as soon as they opened the clear glass door 
Charlie spotted Cayley and Lauren sitting at the closest table to the window. Hit by an awkward wave of teenage shiners, he tried to look away. But it was too late. Josh was already making a beeline for their table. A girl's fancy bumping into you here, opened Josh, as he slid effortlessly into the seat next to Lauren. This left only one place for Charlie to go, right next to Cayley. Before he could sit down, though, Lauren chimed in with, Well, look who's here, stalker boy. We didn't know you were here, honest, said Charlie, as he nervously took his place next to Cayley. It's okay, Charlie, said Cayley softly, turning to him. It's no big deal. You guys should lay off him. Fair enough, said Lauren. But I'm watching you, giving Charlie a warning look. Charlie always felt a little uncomfortable around Lauren. She was so cool and streetwise, seemingly full of confidence and lightning fast with the responses that could knock a man dead at ten paces. He could never be sure when she was joking and when she was being serious. It was no wonder she and Josh got along so well. He couldn't see their recent encounter leading to anything serious, though. They were both just too busy enjoying themselves for that. Charlie didn't think like they did. He just wanted to be with someone special and wasn't interested in any of that playing the field stuff. To be precise, he wanted to be with Cayley. But with Lauren seemingly acting as a very effective guard dog, it seemed unlikely he'd ever get near her, especially after last Saturday's performance. Charlie's musings were interrupted by Josh asking, Who's for milkshakes, then? Nobody was likely to refuse. Jay's diner made an amazing range of milkshakes, which were all up on the wall on a huge painted canvas. There must have been at least fifty different varieties on offer. The four of them chose what they wanted, and Josh got up to go to the self-service counter. I'll come up and help you, offered Cayley, leaving Charlie in the uncomfortable position of being alone with Lauren. He was pretty sure that he was about to get the third degree, but his fears were unfounded. Listen, Charlie, I don't really think you're a stalker. In fact, Cayley really likes you. Really? he asked. Charlie hadn't expected this from Lauren. He was so full of self-doubt after Saturday that he scarcely dared believe that Cayley might still like him. Yes, really. But you made a fool of yourself on Saturday night. If you really wanted to blow your chances with her, you certainly went the right way about it. I'm sorry, I guess I'm not very good at this sort of thing. Josh seems to find it so easy. Yes, he does, and that's one of the reasons I would far rather she ended up with someone like you than someone like him. Charlie was momentarily taken aback by this. He hadn't expected to hear her criticise Josh. He replied with, But on Saturday, didn't you and Josh... His words tailed off, as he couldn't bring himself to say it, but she saved his embarrassment by cutting him short. Yes, we did, and that's the whole point. People like me go with people like Josh. Cayley's different. She's sensitive, and I don't want to see her messed about. You'd be good for her, but you can't afford any more scenes like Saturday. What do you suggest, then? Just play it cool. Take your time and let things happen. Don't try to force it. Lauren looked up to see the others returning to the table. And one final thing. If you break her heart, I'll kill you. Coming from Lauren, he could well believe it. Josh plonked a tray down on the table. OK, here we go, guys. Pineapple for Lauren, chocolate for Charlie, banana for Cayley, and toffee for me. This is very generous of you, Josh, said Cayley. No, it isn't. Charlie's paying. I'm broke, replied Josh. Well, thank you, Charlie, said Cayley. She looked at Charlie and smiled. Peggy Sue was playing on the jukebox as Charlie sucked up his milkshake through the crazy, swirly straws that Jay's provided. He was starting to feel much better. Perhaps this would turn out to be a good day after all. It wasn't turning out to be a good day for everybody. Across town, Peter was sitting in the waiting room in the doctor's surgery. He'd been there over twenty minutes waiting for his appointment to be called. He had flicked unenthusiastically through the small stack of reading material available, which consisted of back copies of Country Life and Homes and Gardens. Now he was eyeing up the various self-help leaflets alongside them on the table. "'Are you drinking too much?' said one of them. "'Check your testicles,' said another. He didn't want to depress himself any further by imagining any more problems, so he decided to give the leaflets a miss. 
he always felt a little uneasy in surgery waiting rooms anyway wondering what diseases other people who had handled the magazines and leaflets might have been carrying a young woman sitting a couple of seats away from him had been coughing and sneezing away as well she had made no effort to use the tissue or even put a hand over her mouth and he could see some small globules from her nose had landed on some leaflets imploring people to eat more fruit and vegetables eventually he was called and he made his way down the short corridor to his doctor's room since his cancer he had to have regular tests and on this occasion his family doctor and friend for twenty years dr alan dickinson had some bad news for him what's the score then alan he asked tentatively i'll come straight to the point peter replied alan with a notable absence of his usual jovial manner we aren't happy with the last lot of blood she did is the cancer back he asked immediately a feeling of impending doom spreading over him now i don't want you to panic we found a lot of abnormal white cells in the latest tests it does not necessarily mean that the cancer is back but i am going to have to send you into hospital as soon as possible for some more tests i've got an appointment for you next week peter thought ahead it was half term next week so no one would need to know he really did not like talking about it with anyone and other than the headmaster no one at school even knew of his illness okay i'll be there what's the prognosis though just give it to me straight i'll be honest with you it does look as if the leukemia may have returned but i don't want you to worry unduly the survival rates are very good these days and if it hasn't developed too far you can be treated alan was doing his best to reassure him but it's not certain i could die he asked nothing certain but things are getting better all the time there are some revolutionary new treatments being trailed in the states that are showing amazing results we should have them over here within a few years by which time we may be able to cure you completely alan was doing his best to sound upbeat but will it be in time to save me asked peter you're not at death's door even with the treatments we have now the five-year survival rates are excellent so there's a good chance you'll be around when these treatments become available how much chance is there can you put a number on it it's not a game of poker peter i can't quote you odds at least not until we know more go to the hospital next week get assessed and then we'll reassess the situation the appointment is on wednesday i guess that's what i'll have to do then thanks alan he walked out feeling somewhat deflated wednesday was nine days away and it seemed like a very long time. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3, 22nd October 2018, 5 p.m. It was after 5 p.m. by the time the boys left the diner. The weather had improved dramatically, and they were able to enjoy a little early evening sunshine on the way home. There was a distinct chill in the air, though, as the nights drew in and leaves were blowing around everywhere in the breeze. Their route took them through the newly constructed tunnel under what was to become the new HS2 railway line. Although construction was at last underway, the project was not scheduled to be complete until 2026. The boys therefore found themselves walking through a tunnel above which no trains would run for at least another eight years. On the way home, the topics of conversation had varied considerably. Now turning to one of Josh's favourite subjects, football. You're wasting your time with Oxford United, mate. They are never going to get out of League Two, said Josh. True, but they're still our nearest club, so we should support them, replied Charlie. They aren't that near, it's just as quick to get up the motorway to Birmingham. Quicker still when this railway's finished, said Josh pointing up to the embankment as they approached the tunnel entrance i'm not supporting aston villa mate and that's that give it up i'd rather support man united than them and they've been rubbish this season besides i hardly think hs2 is going to be wasting its time stopping here the banter continued as they entered the tunnel it had only been open about a month and few people used it yet Work was progressing on a road tunnel nearby, but that was a long way from completion. For now, the main entry road to the estate still crossed the path of the new railway line about 50 metres further along the track, 
but for the boys the tunnel represented a significant shortcut. Today they were not the only ones using the tunnel. There was a middle-aged man walking about thirty yards ahead of them. They weren't paying any real attention to him, for they had no reason to. He was just a bloke walking along the same route as them, and there was nothing unusual in that. However, on this occasion, Charlie just happened to look up when he noticed something very odd indeed. Right in the middle of the tunnel, the man suddenly seemed to disappear, and then a split second later, reappear, continuing to walk on as if nothing had happened. Did you see that? gasped Charlie, astounded at what he'd just seen. See what? asked Josh, who obviously hadn't, or he would have said so. That bloke! He just vanished! 